Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and thanks also for paying attention and caring about these issues. You know, some don't. I'm Eleanor Lowe, and I'm a member of the program committee. And this is the last of our last five of our legislative series. Our goal was to provide useful information, an opportunity for questions, and a dose of aspiration, inspiration, and my own personal favorite, perseverance. <laughs> Tonight's forum is focused on what happened in the 2013 legislature. Have they finally adjourned or not? <laughs> We know that they have not. And so the committee took a look at this when we were setting up these programs starting last year. And we recognized that we probably would have to roll the dice as far as this particular meeting and the date and then that the legislature may not have adjourned, which they have not. And so I guess they're going into overtime. We do have one legislator here, uh, Stephanie Clayton, who serves in the House. <laughs> and we may ask you uh, later, Stephanie, to make some remarks. We're pleased to have her here. She said they were let loose in the House about, what, 3 o'clock or so? Yes, yeah, okay. about 3, 2.30 is when okay. they call us All right. And our scheduled speaker, Joe Estrup, political scientist from K-State, had an unexpected and unavoidable conflict requiring him to be out of town. So before I introduce our speaker tonight, Michael Smith, Professor Michael Smith from Emporia State, I would like to ask Stephanie to say just a few words about what is going on as we speak in the legislature. Stephanie? Here. All right, well, I'd like to thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, the House adjourned at about 2.30 today. Uh, House members will be in, uh, and, and I would like to mention I am a Republican, but you know, I'm the kind of Republican that likes people like you and <laughs> votes my district. Uh, now, my district is the 19th district, so if you live south of 83rd, north of 99th, uh, east of Metcalf and west of State Line, and if you live between Mission Road and State Line all the way down to 435, then I am proud to represent you. Uh, now, <clears throat> just to give a, a small bit of what we're doing now, it is uh, our veto session, which is usually our wrap-up session when we end up taking care of the budget and tax plan, has been at quite a stalemate. We started that on May 8th. And we have been coming in, we'll gavel in, vote on one little bill, and then we'll go home. And it's, it's been this way for several days. Now I can tell you uh, on my schedule tomorrow is uh, starting at eight o'clock in the morning, uh, us uh, House GOP freshmen have been compelled to join our governor for coffee and donuts. Uh, so during which time I have no doubt that he will be speaking to us regarding the tax plan. The tax plan and the budget, as many of you all know, because you've been following this closely, and for, honestly, I haven't been following what the Senate has been doing because things change so quickly. Some of you may be more aware of what's going on in the Senate than I am. Um, <clears throat> and maybe uh, I, I might be better off not knowing what's been going on in the Senate, given. But they're currently debating a budget to send to the House members. Now, there are basically three main schools of thought regarding taxes that are currently taking place now. You have the governor's school of thought, which is uh, we have a very large budget hole created by the March to Zero. The governor is aware of this, and he, he doesn't want to be the bad guy who cuts everything. He wants us to, um, to restore the, uh, the sales tax, which you know is set, as you all know, to sunset on July 1st, and he wants us to vote to uh, keep that from sunsetting. So you have one school of thought, and that's embodied by uh, both the governor and by the Senate. 
You have another school of thought, which is actually to the right of the governor. This is uh, very common among my more conservative colleagues in the House, especially the freshmen. They would prefer the House budget, which does not in, uh, restore that sunset for the tax, and instead cuts even more. So uh, our, our governor is actually dealing with uh, you know, quite a bit of a, I hesitate to say mutiny, but it is a problematic divide because usually it's we moderates who are causing trouble. But as you know, we have very few moderates in the Senate and the Senate is essentially simpatico with the governor. They, uh, the majority is voting with him. Um, so you have the conservatives in the House, and then you have the Democrats and the moderates who are not inclined to support the sales tax, not because we don't care about higher education, but because we frankly do not have the power of appropriations. And um, you know, while I'm moderate, still as a Republican, I get heartburn about thinking about the idea of voting for a sales tax, what I consider, consider to be a sales tax increase. If I am going to vote for that, I would like to have some control over where that money went and what it was spent on. So this is, this is where I am now. When we talk a little bit more about the deeper economic philosophies of some of my colleagues in the House, uh, a couple of days ago, the House GOP freshmen and the Senate GOP freshmen had a little meeting and a little talk about tax policy. And uh, I had to exercise some of my uh, skills from drama class at Shawnee Mission Northwest <laughs> to keep my face straight. And I would like to thank the Academy because it started out with Dr. Laffer and his virtues being extolled and degenerated from there. Let's pause for a moment to consider what I have just told you. <laughs> it degenerated from extolling the virtues of Dr. Laffer to uh, discussing the virtues of the sales tax. And uh, just from a strict economic standpoint, uh, now we all know what creates a good economy here in Johnson County, and that is an excellent quality of life embodied by our, you know, our good law enforcement, which if we properly fund it, will keep all of us safe are excellent schools, which are a huge draw, not only to people moving in here, but to companies who want to establish here. They need an educated workforce, and it's part of my responsibility to make sure that we're providing that. And just our general quality of life. People like to do business here in Johnson County because it's nice here. And so the way that I see it is that you often hear people talk about being pro-growth and being pro-business. and Oftentimes, that connotes an image of cutting government and making government smaller. I believe in what I have seen as a child who's grown up here in Johnson County and who's attended excellent Shawnee Mission schools. I go with what I know. I am a conservative in the true sense of the word, in the fact that I know what works, and I don't want to change it, and I don't like experimentation. Now, uh, I have a lot of great colleagues who feel the same way I do. I did notice uh, that Representative Melissa Rooker, who represents the far northeast corner of Johnson County, has come in, and Representative Nancy Lusk, who represents downtown Overland Park and uh, similar environs, is also here. So I thank them for coming by, too. Uh, but in any case, <laughs> what we are all facing now is a moment, and. <laughs> I hate to say this, but I think this moment may either come tomorrow or worse on Tuesday, where many Republicans especially are going to be asked to support this tax extension. And um, you know, there, there probably will be some strong arming. I, I have had discussions with uh, someone from the governor's office called me. I explained my philosophy of going back and perhaps fixing the past cuts that were made and making them less extreme. Because a tax cut is not a good tax cut if we cannot afford to do it. Uh, my ideas were not received well. And so at this point, uh, tomorrow I will be going as an observer. We have, a, the Senate is currently debating the budget. There are a lot of uh, interesting things that I've been seeing from the live Twitter feed from various reporters and lobbyists there. And uh, I, have, uh, I think perhaps one of the things that shocked me the most is that um, a senator who uh, represents part of my district, the southern part of my district, 
uh, mentioned that it would not be good for us to roll back the, ta the sales tax on food, which is actually something that a lot of conservative Republicans support, uh, because he believes it to be social engineering, and because he believes that rolling back the sales tax on food would cause an obesity epidemic. <laughs> so, um, just to sum that up, that is where we are right at this minute. Uh, things can change very quickly though, so please do follow your updates. We're trying to get newsletters out, but because things change so quickly, it's very difficult to keep you as informed in real time as we would like to. But this is just a little bit of what has been going on in the house. Uh, we're, we're holding strong, we're trying to do our best, and we're digging in our heels and we're representing our districts. And I just want to close on a personal note and say how good it feels to be in a room full of people who use logic and thought when it comes to their ideas surrounding government. So I am grateful to be around you. It's really good to be home. Dr. Smith is a professor of political science at Emporia State University, and he teaches courses in U.S. government, state, and local politics. His current research is focused on the Kansas legislature. So, <laughs> Professor Smith. I'll open by ripping off a line from a, a friend of mine that is probably a friend of some of you as well, Bob Tomlinson, who is the state rep from Roland Park and Mission and then Assistant Insurance Commissioner. Uh, and his opening line he would always use, I always thought, oh, come on, Bob, that's, that's a little over the top, as he can be if you know him. But now I'm not so sure. Um, his, as you know, the Kansas legislature is a citizen legislature. They're only, only in session about four months. Many of them have other jobs, and uh, his other job happened to be that he worked with uh, uh, special emotional needs kids at Shawnee Mission North High School, and people used to ask him about his two jobs. He said, well, working with state legislators, working with emotionally disturbed teenagers, is <laughs> not really that big of a job. <laughs> I, uh, like I say, I used to think he was exaggerating, but I'm starting to wonder. I've um, been asked to address a couple things in particular, and I want to make sure to do that. Um, the first was budget and tax issues, and I'm a little worried because I know you all are really plugged in politically, and I'm a little concerned that I may cover things you already know. So I'm going to give it a shot, and then if, I'm, if this is uh, like review session day, just feel free to stop me and say, come on, Smith, we already know this stuff. Come on. Keep them moving. But um, just some of the basics. What's that? Oh, sure. Um, just some of the basics here. Um, uh, Representative Clayton mentioned the Laffer curve, and I think that turned out to be a big issue. And so just a, a quick, like a two-minute review of this. Uh, the economist Arthur Laffer, um, uh, working with other conservative economists in the 1970s, the urban legend is he first drew his famous Laffer curve on a cocktail napkin but he says he doesn't remember actually doing that. Um, but um, he came up with an idea, which is, is very commonsensical, and he was able to back it up with data. Um, and, and you have to keep in mind that we forget this, we, we forget our history, that in the 1950s and early 1960s, a bill actually signed by President Eisenhower, Kansas, um, raised the top tax rate. Top tax rate at that time was 91.5%, was the top federal tax bracket. And President Kennedy signed a bill cutting that all the way down to 70%. Um, today, it's uh, after the fiscal cliff negotiations, it's about 40. Before that, it was lower. Um, and uh, what Laffer found in his research is that cutting that tax rate from 91.5% to 70% uh, actually produced so much economic growth that the government ended up actually collecting more tax revenue because there was a bigger base. There was more economic activity. Uh, and this was the beginning of the supply side idea, that if those that have enough money, that they don't live paycheck to paycheck, they have money to invest, it's investment capital, if they have more of that, they can invest that in creating jobs. And he backed up the data and he drew the famous curve, whether it was on a napkin, I don't know. Um, and, and when you're talking about cutting tax rates from 91.5% to 70%, that holds up pretty well. 
Um, even in the early Reagan administration, we saw some laugh or curve effect from those tax cuts, which was even after the, the 81 tax cut, the federal tax rate, the top tax rate, was much higher than it is today. Um, and so what's happened in Kansas is that Governor Brownback and um, David Kensinger and the other people he works with are uh, big fans of Laffer. They actually hired Laffer as a consultant. And Laffer came to Kansas and said, hey, I've got a, a great idea. Let's take the Laffer curve. If tax rates get super high, cut them, you'll actually end up with so much economic growth that you've got a broader base to tax, lower tax rates, but a broader base. We'll actually end up with more money. Let's do that in the state of Kansas. And um, it said that Governor Brownback is also friends with Governor Perry down in Texas. And that was a, uh, well, that kind of reaction. Um, that was a, a factor as well. And uh, one of the things that sets Texas apart, not from all other states, but from many, is that Texas has no income tax. And so put the pieces together, and they came up with an agenda. Let's phase out the Kansas income tax piece by piece. Can't do it all at once. Too big of a change. But let's phase that out and get some Texas-sized economic growth for the state of Kansas. Um, and that's, again, I think this is what Representative Clayton was alluding to. That's where that, of course, the other piece of that is that Governor Brownback and his, his right-hand man, uh, David Kensinger, worked very aggressively to clear out their primary obstacle, which was the moderate majority in the Kansas Senate. That's gone. Uh, and they got the conservatives elected in the, in the primaries in 2010. And so now they've got no real obstacle in the legislature to doing this. Except, as my good friend Champ Rackaway out of Fort Hayes State wrote in his column, which is coming out this Sunday, unfortunately it doesn't run in the Kansas City area, but it runs all over Kansas elsewhere, um, that the governor have, should have been careful what he asked for. Because... The governor and the majority in the legislature, they're all conservatives, but they're not the same breed of conservative. Governor Brown back, back and his closest advisors come from a little bit different school of thought. He certainly is a small government guy, but he sees a role there. He doesn't like the income tax funding that. He sees the sales and local property and other taxes as being the more appropriate way to get revenue, and the argument is that the income tax discourages growth or pushes employers to other states. The sales tax is paid a little bit at a time. It's a hidden tax for the most part, except when you buy a car. And even in Kansas, you can finance them when you buy a car, and so it's even kind of a hidden tax for that. That's usually where the sales tax gets you when you buy a car. But uh, even, even that is kind of hidden in Kansas. It's a little bit at a time. It's a tax on consumption, not on investment. So. Let's do this. Uh, whereas the legislature that he fought so hard to get elected, their philosophy is more, government's too big. Let's, let's cut the income tax and eventually face it out and replace it with nothing. <laughs> let's get rid of a lot of these unnecessary programs in, in big government, which is, is that perception. So, so the governor is in this weird situation where he's the guy that wants to raise taxes. But it's a very specific kind of tax. It's that sales tax. Um, I wrote a column a while back. Um, I am not a fan of using taxes as a model of economic growth. My own personal opinion. I love going on vacation in Texas. It's really fun. I've never been to Austin. I'm dying to go. I've been on the San Antonio River Walks. I've been in the Fort Worth Stockyards. I've been in downtown Dallas. I've had their barbecue, which... <laughs> There's a place I know that has much better barbecue, but you're probably familiar with it. But uh, um, as far as economic growth, I really worry about Texas. They're number one in the nation for percentage of people with no health insurance. One in four Texans. Uh, and that's our nation's second largest state. So when you see those uninsured numbers for the United States, the state of Texas alone drives a lot of those numbers. Because our nation's second largest state has one in four people that have no health insurance. Uh, their economic growth rate is okay. It's actually not that high. And once you take out the natural resources base from the oil, uh, whenever oil prices go up, you've got more domestic oil production because it's more cost effective to produce more oil. Take out that factor, because uh, you can't really give politics the credit for that, that just there happens to be oil under the ground. 
I'm, like I say, um, I know you're not supposed to mess with Texas, and I, I love going down there for vacation and everything, but I question Texas as an economic growth model. Um, in terms of wage growth, not actually that great over the past 10 years or so. Um, there's been some boom type growth, but there's been that in a lot of states, including some that have higher tax rates as well. But the, again, I'm getting off on my opinion. The, the basic reality is, the philosophy is this Laffer curve. Cut taxes, promote economic growth. That economic growth gives you a bigger base to tax, lower tax rates, bigger base. You end up with as much money or more than you had before. Uh, my criticism of that is I think that works great when you're cutting the top tax rate from 91.5% to 70%, which is what President Kennedy did. Great. 91.5% is a little steep. Uh, <laughs> But in Kansas, the highest tax rate it was never uh, even in the double digits. Uh, if we're talking single, we're talking below 10% tax rates. Uh, all along, even before we started talking about cutting the tax rate. Um, and the thing about the Laffer curve, if you can envision a curve, is the idea is if you have 0% tax rates, you get no tax revenue. Right? No. If you have 100% tax rates, the argument is you also get no tax revenue because there's no incentive to work. It, it all goes to taxes. And so in between 0 and 100, you have this curve shape. At first, as you raise taxes, you get more government revenue until you hit a certain point, and then taxes get so high that it discourages investment, it discourages productivity, because you don't get to keep most of what you earn, and you go back down until you hit zero again at 100% taxation. Well, again, when we were starting out, Kansas' top tax rate was, I believe, I don't pay it, but I believe it was about 9%. Um, I think that we're still on the part of the curve where we're going up, <laughs> where it, we could actually get more revenue by raising taxes. I don't think we got to the crest part there where we hit that sweet spot where we've got the maximum balance between taxation and revenue at 9%. Uh, and so my issue with the Laffer curve is not the theory, it's the application. Having said that, Arthur Laffer himself was a consultant on this tax plan. Um, one more thing um, that I just I have to vent. Because uh, the, the fools gave me a microphone. I don't know what they were thinking. <laughs> I have an issue. Um, I have kind of a complicated life, not to get into my life story, but I work in Emporia. Um, uh, I go to church with Lorreen and Karen, who are here. Um, and actually, our pastor used to be the father of the pastor of this church. Uh, my wife's job is here. My stepson's school is here. So I live in Kansas City and commute. It's complicated, but it's easier for me to commute than for them to move. Um, and so I'm actually a Missouri. Oh. And um, so, you know, Representative Clayton commented on the excellent law enforcement over here in Johnson County. Obviously, they dropped the ball because they let me in tonight. But um, I, some of this economic growth that they're counting is tax incentive packages for businesses in this area to move between the two states. Mm -hmm. And I really have an issue with that. It's not an anti Kansas thing um, because Missouri does it too. Uh, Kansas is better at it, usually, but Kansas City did get the Applebee's headquarters and a few other things. Um, I talked to a friend of mine who's an economist down in Fourier State, Rob Catlett, and I said, what do you think about this incentivizing business to move across state line road and say, look at these jobs. Uh, AMC Theaters, classic example. I think it was 45 million of your tax dollars, not mine, I don't live in Kansas. Uh, 45 million of your tax dollars went to get AMC Theaters to move from downtown Kansas City to Leewood. I assume that no, none of the employees are actually moving, that they're just going to commute to work at this new location. And I asked my, my friend who's an economist, I said, does that count as a new job traditionally? No. Okay. The employee and their family has to move, or it doesn't count as a new job. Job growth is based on where the employee lives. Mm -hmm. And so another one of my issues is that um, I think that what economic growth you're getting from those tax cuts is being exaggerated by counting employers moving across State Line Road right in this neighborhood, right around here. Like, well, Applebee's went to Missouri, but AMC went to Kansas, and there have been others that have moved back and forth, and, and I think that's phony economic growth. I think you have to create a job that did not exist before 
rather than move, get somebody to move a job from one state to the other. Um, but anyway, enough of the soapbox. Um, so with these tax issues then, the issue is, well, we're going to have some sort of a tax cut. Uh, and one of the things they're negotiating is that uh, there was a, what was supposed to be a temporary sales tax passed during the Parkinson administration. It's sunsetted, set to expire. Governor Brownback wants to continue that. It will not put back all of the revenue that the income tax cut would cost. And by the way, most of the revenue estimates are not showing much of a Laffer curve effect. Again, I think because taxes just aren't high enough for you to see that Laffer curve effect the state tax in Kansas. Um, and so um, there's debate over that, but we all know we're going to take cuts. Uh, where will the cuts fall? Um, one of the things, and again, I really apologize if I'm telling you things you already know, but just the kind of basic, the 30 second little talk. We all know, for example, in the federal government, not all budget items are created equal, right? You got Medicare, interest on the national debt, national defense, and Social Security, I just named about 80% of the federal budget. You can fire all the air traffic controllers you want to and you're not going to balance the federal budget until taxes, Medicare, national defense, and Social Security, or at least some comedy, maybe not Social Security, but certainly the other ones are on the table, we're not going to have a balanced budget. It's the same thing at the state level. The state doesn't have a bunch of roughly equal sized categories. When we're talking about the state budget, we're talking about two things. The K-12 through school-based funding formula and Medicaid. Those two dominate the state budget almost as much as the things I just named dominate the federal budget. So you can fool around and talk about, oh, well, you know, let's uh, not buy new cars for the motor pool this year, or let's not give executive bonuses to somebody, whatever. And that might be great politics symbolically, but it has nothing to do with the state budget. If we're going to balance the state budget without tax increases, it's going to come down to K-12 and Medicaid because that's where the money is. I guess, y'all remember uh, Ross Perot? Mm -hmm. <laughs> remember he said, just like a crazy at the basement. Uh, he, he said that the bank robber, Willie Sutton, they asked him, why do you uh, rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is. <laughs> Apparently, that's an urban legend. Willie Sutton never said that, but it's a great story. Well, if you want to talk about cutting the state budget, why are they talking about K-12 and Medicaid? Because that's where the money is. Um, so on K-12, this actually spills over into another issue I was asked to talk about, which is the courts. Uh, because there's a little problem in cutting the K-12 school-based funding formula, which in modified version is uh, the one that passed in the late 1980s. And here's some political trivia for you. One of the authors of that bill was a young state legislator from Topeka named Kathleen Sebelius. It has a per pupil amount. There's a local option budget, which is big politics right around here, as you probably know. Um, and then there are weighting formulas for what counts as a pupil with extra weights for uh, special needs, English as a second language, rural students and things like uh, free reduced uh, student lunches, things like that. Um, and um, the governor would like to rewrite that formula. However, he hasn't proposed to do that yet. What he's done so far is just to cut that base per pupil amount. Well, as many of you I'm sure already know, uh, the state has already been taken to court by various school districts when that amount gets too low. Uh, and where that comes from is uh, there are two things together. And the Kansas Constitution uh, guarantees the right to a free public education up to a certain age, I think it's 17. Um, and it also has a provision like part of the uh, 14th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution guaranteeing equal protection of the laws. What happens when you put those two together and you've got a district, a school like, oh, I don't know, just to pick one at random, Shawnee Mission High, East High School, uh, that literally was spending more than three times as much money per pupil as uh, the poorer districts in the state. And by the way, the poorer districts in the state, just so we're all clear on this, um, they're certainly, if you look at, say, Wyandotte County, inner city Wichita, inner city Topeka, it's not as wealthy as here. That's obvious. Those are not the poorest districts in the state. Poorest districts in the state are in rural counties. Cherokee County in southeast Kansas, Trago County in western Kansas, north central Kansas, 
These are the poorest districts in the state. Uh, they would love to have Wyandotte County's tax base compared to what they have. Um, and those are the lowest income districts. And when districts around here can spend more than three times as much money per pupil, which is what it was before the formula passed, um, than the, the poorest districts, then you get into a situation where um, the courts have ruled you, you flunk equal protection of the laws. You're not granting the students equal protection under the law that Kansas will provide a free public education. Now, to be honest, what the school-based funding formula does, and there are no bones about it, it's a complicated formula, but the bottom line is it redistributes money from right here to rural Kansas, big time, um, and also caps that local option budget. So that's going to come up. But what the governor's doing right now is cutting that per pupil amount. Um, and um, the courts are likely to have an issue with that. Wichita School District is one that's always ready to file a lawsuit and there are others. Uh, and so I think that's a major part of the push to restructure the courts. And the structure, the push to restructure the courts is, in essence, to have it something like a federal model where the governor appoints a judge and there's confirmation by the Senate, um, cutting way back on this use of a panel of lawyers that recommend candidates to the governor. Uh, some conservatives really have an issue with that. The Bar Association, of course, really wants that to stay. Uh, but that panel of lawyers that recommend the candidates to the governor is actually one of the biggest sticking points. Not the other aspect of what I proudly call, I'm not making this up, this is really the name, the current plan is called the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan, because Missouri was actually the first state to use it. Um, there's that other piece that hasn't even been mentioned in the debate, but you know what that piece is, because you all vote, and you see on the ballot where it says, Shall Justice Loreen Miller be retained in office? Yes or no? And then it goes on, and the voters can vote whether or not to retain an office. If this change passes, that's gone too. Uh, and that's really, and 95 plus percent of the time, the voters vote yes, or they just don't vote on that. But occasionally they vote no. And it's interesting that there's been no fuss about that part going away, that voter check. Um, but nevertheless, I really think a lot of what the governor wants to do, there's also a talk of amending the state constitution to make it clear that the courts cannot get involved in budgeting issues or taxing issues. Again, the governor's hands are really tied on this K-12 thing right now because if he cuts it much more, it's going to court. The formula he would like to pass would probably not pass muster under current court rulings because it would shift it back to the local communities and property taxes more. Um, and it would, it would change those weights for special needs students and so on and so forth. So that's part of what this courts thing is about. That may not be the only thing, but it's part of it. The other piece then is Medicaid. And that's been really big lately. I shouldn't say if you've been following the news. I know you all follow the news. Um, because there's this, there's this idea that uh, insurance companies should be hired and paid on a per capita basis to administer Medicaid. And the big flap last week, of course, was does that include people with intellectual and developmental disabilities? And I wrote my column about that last week. Uh, and there's a major pushback that the, the folks that don't support that being a part of this knew what they call can care, the system of hiring the insurance companies to contract it out. Uh, is, uh, there were over a thousand people that marched in Topeka. The, the anti-privatization folks are running ads now down in Wichita. There's a major, major pushback on that. Uh, but that's a population with some, some special needs that can be very expensive. Um, and those are the kinds of things that have to be on the table if we're serious about cutting taxes and balancing the budget without, without many tax increases. Um, so that's my sort of quick and dirty description of the budget. I also mentioned the judicial uh, selection issue. Um, one other thing on here was uh, Chris Kobach. <laughs> um, I love that yard sign, like Phil Klein, then you'll love Chris Kobach. <laughs> uh, Kind of, kind of says it all there. Um, and and uh, Kobach, of course, is uh, uh, he's on the national stage. The uh, anti-illegal immigrant initiative in Arizona, he wrote it. The one in Ari uh, Alabama, he wrote it. 
Uh, the legend is he wrote it on his laptop while he was talking on the phone with anti-illegal immigration activists. Um, Kobach initiatives this year, uh, a lot of them, um, the, the, here's the thing, here's the, the thing that, that is kind of behind the scenes on the immigration thing. You know, why in the world doesn't Kansas really go, go Kobach and get these illegal immigrants? Um, I teach in Emporia, I don't live in Emporia. Um, I have a good friend that teaches in Hayes. My students, a lot of them come from rural Kansas, um, especially in the meatpacking towns. There is no economy without, not just immigrants, but undocumented immigrants. Um, they are really carrying the economies of Emporia, Garden City, Liberal, and some of these other communities on their shoulders. Um, and, of course, there's also migrant labor that works in the farm fields as well. So here's what I'm saying. Very quietly, they don't want to make a splash, they don't want me to be up here telling you this, but the Farm Bureau very, very quietly works behind the scenes to kill anti-illegal immigrant legislation because the farmers couldn't afford it. Yeah. So that's the kind of, of, of hidden secret of, you know, how come Kansas doesn't get, you know, do an Arizona type thing with illegal immigrants? It's actually the Farm Bureau. Uh, you know, God bless those groups. I've actually been active in one that defend immigrants' rights from a progressive perspective. They're great and they do great work, but they don't have a lot of clout with this legislature. Uh, the Farm Bureau does. Uh, and so that's what that's all about. Of course, Kobach is also a big fan of uh, cracking down on voter fraud. Um, <laughs> evidently, he doesn't feel you have to document that there is any actual voter fraud before cracking down on it. Um, just the possibility that there might be. A um, friend of mine, a um, couple friends of mine, again, I mentioned Chap Rackaway, who's another person, along with Joe Astrup and me, we write our newspaper columns. We take turns. Uh, we actually have a study coming out on some of these new laws, the voter ID laws and so forth. We're not seeing a lot of depression voter turnout as a result of these laws, although this new one where you have to show a birth certificate to register to vote, that'll be an interesting one to watch, and we will be watching it. But right now, certainly in 2012, President Obama had such an aggressive field office get out the vote campaign that it appears to have negated any effect in pushing down voter turnout that those laws would have in states like Florida and Ohio where they passed. Uh, so we'll take a look at Kansas too, but uh, for all the, the hue and fuss about those laws, they don't really appear to be doing much as far as voter turnout. Um, I was asked to keep it to 20 minutes. I don't think I did that, but that's a kind of an overview of the topics that, uh, that I was asked to talk about. Um, they mentioned uh, taking questions, so I'd, I'd be happy to. I just want to know where I can read your columns. Oh, the columns, um, they run um, everywhere in Kansas except in Kansas City, unfortunately. Um, but um, um, the, probably the, the newspapers that can carry us most consistently are Hutchinson, um, Ottawa, Hayes, Pittsburgh. Uh, and we sometimes run in the Wichita Eagle, but they're a little bit temperamental. They don't always care about it. But it's just a group of us that take turns. Joe Astrup is, is one of the authors, and they come out usually on Sunday mornings. Uh, probably the most consistent one would probably be Hutchinson, the Hutchinson News. And the name of our group is Insight Kansas. We also have a blog, if you're interested, which is if you just want to Google Insight Kansas on WordPress. If you just put in Insight Kansas, it doesn't work, but if you also put WordPress, it'll pop right up, and you can see our blog, and then we keep all the columns on there. Great. She's asking, could you speak to the higher education issues in, in the state and the loss of money? Boy, could I. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I have to tell, I wasn't going to do this, but I have to tell you a little story. Uh, down at Emporia State, our political science program is uh, not the largest program on campus. We have three faculty, graduate about five or six students a year, um, and, um, but our students are phenomenal. In fact, Representative Clayton's intern uh, was one of our students. We were just visiting over here in the view about a, this student that we have in common. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, uh, one of the things done in the name of budget cuts is they were scrutinizing these smaller programs. And our program was mentioned. Maybe we should merge you with 
history, because, you know, political science, history, whatever, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, <laughs> lay off, not lay off, they, they were not going to lay off anybody, but uh, leave some faculty positions unfilled when people retire, you know, the old attrition strategy and so forth. Um, and the interesting thing about that was taking it upon themselves with no rewards or prompting from us, our students got active. And all at once there were sit-ins, t-shirts, um, uh, Twitter accounts, uh, articles on the front page of the student newspaper, articles on the front page of the Emporia Gazette. Um, there was major, major pushback. Um, and uh, the students really made the point much better than we ever could, because after all, we're pretty biased and have a vested interest that these cuts have consequences. Uh, and the, the arbitrary numbers, like how many graduates do you have every year, are not always the best measure of an academic program. You know, if we were measured by percentage of our graduates to go to graduate school, we'd probably be the top one on campus. But that wasn't the measure used. Um, and so, you know, the, these cuts have consequences. And if there are heavy cuts made, there's going to be a major pushback, I think. And I think a lot of it is likely to come from the students once they feel it, once the class they need to graduate is cut, once their favorite professor is not tenured, once these kinds of things affect the students. Uh, the, the myth of the apathetic uh, students is, is, has been debunked by our students. Uh, on a policy level, what would happen? Um, the obvious tuition increases to make up some of the money. Uh, smaller programs would be cut, undoubtedly. Um, and I think that the other thing they're talking about is, is um, uh, some faculty get releases from some of our teaching to do research or service. Those would go away. So we'd all be expected to teach a full load, which would create some opportunities, again, for reduction of faculty by attrition. Um, some of the things, like all the money you see spent on fancy new student unions and dorms and things like that, which our campuses are so heavily invested in right now, um, those are taken out of a different budget, they're taken out of student fees, and they have nothing to do with this. So it's, it's going to come down to faculty salaries uh, if they do this, or possibly benefits. However, most of us aren't capers, most of us are on a 401k type thing. Um, so that would be a little bit tougher, because there's, there's nothing to cut. <laughs> um, as you look around the country, are there other states where there's somebody like Brownback in charge, or where has he gotten his world view? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, one person I've mentioned who, who has actually reached out to us um, is a fellow that's, that's one of those that you don't read his name in the newspapers, and that's deliberate, but everybody in Topeka knows his name. A fellow named David Kensinger, who was very close to Brownback when he was a senator. Very close. He was chief of staff, and then he resigned and started a consulting shop and ran the campaigns of those conservatives that beat the moderates in the 2010 Republican primaries. Um, Kanziger is is very astute politically. And he knows how to win elections. He knows what buttons to push. Uh, he knows where to go to raise money, um, and he also has that conservative world view. Um, I wrote one of the the uh, yeah the first newspaper column I ever wrote was actually about the time that Brownback and Obama teamed up. Um, this is not a joke. Brownback and Obama agree very strongly on um, genocide in Darfur, Sudan, and um, on a lot of international type issues. They also appeared together at that Saddleback Church in California, Rick Warren's church, um, to speak uh, that we need to do something about AIDS. And both of them got tested right then and there, which I think was really powerful because conservatives and African Americans are two groups that are very apprehensive about getting tested for AIDS. And you've got one of, one of each right there saying, and we're not afraid to do it. You need to do it as well. I mean, Brownback has done some incredible stuff. He was one of the leaders on Darfur when he was in the Senate. Um, I take the man at his word. I think he has a very deep and profound religious faith and that he works from that, and that informs a lot of what he does. When, when I talk to people that kind of work sort of behind the scenes in state government, 
um, they often emphasize that uh, that marriage, the idea that the, that the state should encourage marriage, is a much bigger issue internally within the Brownback administration than you hear them talking about publicly. Um, and uh, you know how you do that is problematic. But but I, I think that when he talks about his faith, I don't think it's a show, um, which you know I can't believe that that would be true of Rick Perry. <laughs> but maybe it is. They are friends, or maybe they agree to disagree. I don't know. But with Brownback, I, I really have to think it's for real. Um, that it comes from a set of, of faith-based values. The problem being, for me personally, they're not the same ones that I have. <laughs> uh, and that creates a lot of conflict. Well, what about uh, his economic Well, yeah. Where did that come from? Well, it may have come from Arthur Laffer. Um, Laffer, uh, I'm speculating here, but I don't know how, if Kensinger, this fellow I keep mentioning, this kind of Rambach's right-hand man, was close to Laffer maybe in Washington, D.C., um, you know, the, uh, you know, I'm pretty proud of myself. I've spoken up this whole time without mentioning the Koch brothers. Yeah. But uh, I'll mention it now. They're big Arthur Laffer fans. They fund the Cato Institute and the Kansas Policy Institute and other libertarian groups. Um, and, I mean, there, there are whole schools of thought to produce studies and reports and, and all of it um, that, that uh, have been working at this since the 1970s to, to def defend their, their uh, intellectual point of view. Uh, some people, you know, you've probably heard this lament sometimes, oh, all those liberal college professors, that's the problem with the university, it's all dominated by liberals. Uh, and that's not entirely true. I have conservative colleagues. I teach with a fellow who's personal friends with Brown. Um, but the other thing that hasn't been mentioned on the liberal college professors is it isn't just the so-called tenured radicals from the 60s or whatever. It's the fact that so many conservative scholars work in these think tanks. They work for Cato, they work for Heritage, they work for the American Enterprise Institute instead of in universities. Um, and they've got more money. You know, liberals basically have the Brookings Institution and that's it. Uh, and so that's another reason why you see conservatives, they can get oftentimes better pay and obviously do research full time to work in these think tanks. So my sense is that that's probably where he picked it up, but I don't know the man personally, so I don't know for sure. She asked me to speak to women's rights issues um, as they stand. Um, the legislature passed a very aggressive anti-abortion bill um, defining life as beginning at the moment of conception uh, and um, taking away tax breaks for contributions to Planned Parenthood and so forth. Um, this uh, is almost certainly unconstitutional. They've done this several times. They also did it with that gun bill, that thing they've a gun is manufactured and sold and used in Kansas that it can't be raised. That doesn't work constitutionally. They know that. They don't care. Um, they want to go to court. They want the confrontation. So that, um, you know, that anti-abortion bill that passed, a lot of it's unenforceable, um, and they know that, but they want, they want the confrontation, and they also want it to be there in case the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, ever does allow for a law like that to be enforced. So they're ready to go. They don't have to pass the law because it's already on the books. They just start enforcing it. Um, those have been the, that, that, that's been the primary area that I'm familiar with. Can I have a question? Sure. Um, so when we're here in the final days of legislative session and they're trying to get the budget and the tax bill over the line and get it done, which they're already at their, they're, they're past 80, we're maxed out, um, they, they start talking about vote trading in order to get the votes that they need to get done and go home. And um, in terms of like women's rights, we know that there's the heartbeat bill that would ban um, all abortions after about four to six weeks. Um, that's in some of those vote trading conversations. But what seems to be um, a higher priority is um, opting Kansas out of the Common Core. So I was hoping, and we're seeing you know strong pushes in the local Republican parties, and we're seeing rallies at the Capitol, and that's continuing to come up. So I was hoping you could address that. I just stumbled on that uh, last night when I was researching to, to come here today. Um, uh, as far as I can tell, you probably know a lot more about it than I do. 
as far as I can tell, the conservative objection. Of course, what we're talking about, we have the No Child Left Behind law, and it's got a lot of pushback from students, teachers, parents, you name it. Um, and so there's this movement for several states to voluntarily collaborate and set what's called a common core for these assessment standards so that rather than having 50 different states with 50 different systems of assessment, <coughs> they could share. And that would be easier for materials development. That'd be easier. I mean, right now, you can't compare schools in Missouri and Kansas to each other because the standards and the testing are so different. There's, it's apples and oranges. This would fix that, and so on and so forth. And the conservatives, you're right. They're fighting Common Core really hard. Um, and as far as I can tell, um, it's a, a fear that that could eventually lead to federalization. That, that it's, it starts down the slippery slope. Common Core is not actually federal. It's a voluntary effort of several states. However, I, I think it's, it's, it's the same way of reasoning that you see, for example, about gun control issues. Well, why should, what's so bad about background checks? Well, if you have background checks, you have a national registry. If you have a national registry, the government can use that to, to take away people's guns. It's the same thing here. Common Core sounds good on the surface, but once we have national standards, then the federal government can just go ahead and take over. And we want to stop that before we start down the slippery slope. I haven't, I didn't read as I tried to research this last night, I didn't read any specific objections like, oh, I don't like how they're testing for math or, or you know, things that are actually about the standards. Uh, although there has been, I, I don't understand this, maybe you all can explain it to me. I know the political conservatives are very strong proponents of the phonics method of teaching reading instead of the whole language method. Why that's ideological, I don't know. But I know that some conservatives are really, really passionate about that. So that might have something to do with it. Maybe they, for the whole language, some of the texts they feel have a liberal bias or what have you. I don't know what the issue is, but that could be part of it. But I think a lot of it is just, it's, it's that slippery slope argument. The federal government will have a much easier time taking over if the states do this than if the states keep it separate. Sir? Are there any examples of states that have cut their income tax uh, as significant as Kansas and what the results have been? I'm not aware. I mean, the states like Texas, um, Florida, South Dakota, Tennessee um, that have no income tax, most of those states, it goes way back. Um, I can't think of a modern day example of a state that used to have an income tax, but got rid of it. Uh, the closest I can think of that I would know anything about, um, I, I happen to be lucky enough to have gotten to chat with uh, the former governor of Florida, Bob Graham, because he wrote a book about teaching citizenship that I use in my classes. And we struck up a friendship and so forth. But uh, uh, Florida has no income tax, so I was able to ask him about that. He has, how's that no income? Because it didn't have an income tax when he was governor. And he pointed out that a lot of that was designed to draw tourism. Uh, and it's Florida. Tourism and a, a lot of that retirement growth, all the jokes, you know, Jerry Seinfeld used to say, you know, I'm from New York, but my parents live in Florida now. They didn't want to move when they retired, but in New York, it's the law. <laughs> but really, it's, it isn't just the weather. A lot of that's tax migration because Florida has no income tax. And it's upper income retirees that tend to migrate. Middle and lower income retirees tend to just stay where they are. You know, stay in their houses, stay at home, and, and that's where they live. That, that moving to Florida or moving to Arizona business is mostly upper income retirees. And they have a lot at stake in terms of whether or not there's a state income tax. So I suppose it works reasonably well for Florida. Um, I mean, Bob didn't come right out and say, yeah, I'm really glad we don't have an income tax, but he said, you know, I understand the rationale for why Florida has no income tax. And when you're Florida, it probably makes sense. Um, are people going to retire and move to Kansas? Uh, is there going to be a, a tourist boom in Kansas? Um, Texas? Uh, Texas is another one. Also Alaska. Alaska has no income tax. They get a lot of severance tax off oil and natural gas. Uh, Kansas has oil resources, as you know, but Kansas can't even come close to matching Texas or Alaska. So severance taxes on that are not going to make up for the absence of an income tax. 
of your question. She asked me, by the way, um, <laughs> is there a philosophical basis to this move to cut the school-based funding formula and, and to ultimately write a new formula? And I, I think that's a good question. I, I agree with the premise of your question. I think there probably is. Uh, I think that part of the conservative uh, mindset is the more local, the better. The closer to the people, the better. Um, a lot of the conservative push over the years, of course, has been to move things from the federal government to the states. But I think there's also some interest in moving things out of Topeka to the local communities. Um, that that if, if, if schools are more locally funded, there's more local control over the curriculum and a whole host of other things. Uh, I, I think you're probably right. Thank you. I, I'll be brief. Melissa Rooker, 25th District, and I sit on the Education Committee. Yes, <laughs> not just Shawnee Mission, but districts from all around the state are fighting back vigorously against this push to defund because they've invested three years of time, energy, resources in staff development and um, a, a shifting of curriculum and it just so that they can do the work to be prepared to align with the standards that are in place. And the expectation is that in August when our schools start back, this is what they'll be teaching. So they have been training and, and preparing for this. So it's not just thousands of dollars, it's millions of dollars invested in the, um, the, the changeover to Common Core. The, the, what we heard in education when people were coming to testify to get us to vote to defund is that this is a, a breathtaking federal government takeover of our education system. <laughs> We had experts come in from out of state to tell us how the Common Core would be implemented in the state of Kansas, and they don't know a thing about what's actually going on in Kansas. In Kansas, textbooks are adopted by our local districts. Our, our own local school boards determine what materials are used. Our testing has been done to the state assessments online via computer since the state assessments were implemented a decade or more ago. So we don't have the kind of changeover costs that other states, not everybody has computer <coughs> testing in place, so those states may have to invest in that infrastructure. Kansas did that years ago, so we don't have that cost. Um, we don't have statewide textbook adoptions. Texas does, so you know, there is, is a, a level of control that's removed from the local level. Our teachers are in control of their lesson plans. The standards themselves simply say that at the end of each given grade level, there are certain expectations for what a student will, the knowledge that they will possess as they move on to the next grade level. And all the Common Core curriculum does is standardize that across the country. As somebody who moved when my kids were entering fourth grade and entering seventh grade respectively, it was a tough shift to come from California to Kansas because math standards didn't align. And there was, a, there was remediation involved and it was stressful for my kids. So what we've been presented with is a vision for a child-centric education system, which um, is a lot of conservative code for we want to, um, we want to allow parental choice, we want to allow for parents to decide what their kids learn and how they learn it. it. It's geared towards homeschool, it's geared towards private schools, it's geared towards getting the certified teachers out of the classroom because you know that they, they just really have a bias against all that. So it's an anti-federal government movement um, and it, it, it really is not steeped in the reality of the situation on the ground in the state of Kansas. It was Kansas teachers who developed our curriculum guidelines to, it, it, yes, they align with Common Core, but um, there's a lot of inconsistency in play, and um, the bit, to get back to the question you originally asked, yes, our school districts have been in Topeka. Um, we've had a, a strong presence online with emails and, and correspondence trying to, to share the truth, so. Can you just help while yourself? Can you address what the consequences of what happens if Common Core yeah. is defined? Well, um, Common Core standard, the, the curriculum in Kansas is called College and Career Readiness Curriculum. It incorporates the, the, the basic Common Core standards for math 
and English, English language arts. This curriculum is the basis of our waiver from No Child Left Behind. So if we vote to defund Common Core, and by the way, the bill says, or, it, it, or any aspect of the Common Core, um, which is dangerous in that, how do you define, there's no line item. You can't just wipe out the line item that says funding for Common Core because it doesn't exist. It's woven into the fabric of what our districts are doing and how they're, they're training and teaching. So if you have this language become the law, then what happens is um, we basically have to roll, the only recourse we have would be to roll back to what we've been doing, which would undo the waiver, put us back under No Child Left Behind. And there's actually a five-year plan for what happens if your school fails to meet the AYP, Adequate Yearly Progress Benchmark. And PS, 2013-2014, the upcoming school year, is the year that our students across the country under AYP are supposed to be 100% of them meet the proficiency standard. And our Department of Education in Kansas predicts that 95% of the schools in the state of Kansas will fail to meet that AYP benchmark. When, when you're labeled a failing school, there's a five-year prescription for what happens to improve your, your outcomes. It culminates in year four, the, the school can um, get rid of all of the teachers that are on staff. They can, they can clean house, and year five, they become a, a charter school. They, be, they come under a private management, and I, somehow I think that the proponents of this don't see that as a negative outcome. That, that was a big part of the agenda that was in front of us on the education committee this year. Can you speak to the regressive nature of sales tax? Sure. Um, the, Sales tax is regressive, and of course what that means is that uh, with people with lower incomes pay a higher percentage of their money in sales tax than people with higher incomes. Now, in absolute value, of course, people with higher incomes pay more sales tax. People with higher incomes buy more expensive food, they buy more expensive cars, they buy more expensive clothes, and so they're paying more in sales tax, but they don't pay proportionately. Um, in fact, I just saw a study the other day about how much American families spend on food. Um, and upper income families only spend about one and a half times as much on food as lower income families. And we might be talking about two families and one makes ten times the money. Uh, and so even though the wealthy consume more expensive products, it's not proportional. The wealthy still end up with a higher percentage of their income being put into investments which are not subject to the sales tax. Whereas lower income people live paycheck to paycheck. They spend every dime on things that just to survive, food, uh, clothing, keeping the lights on, and so on and so forth. Most of those things are sales tax. Um, as you probably know, Kansas adds a little extra regressive sting to the sales tax because Kansas does not exempt groceries from the sales tax. Uh, so for example, Missouri also sales taxes groceries, but a much lower rate. Nebraska does not sales tax groceries at all. Um, and, and that food is one of those things that everybody has to buy. And, and not exempting groceries adds to a lot of the regressivity of the sales tax. And that Representative Clayton mentioned that earlier, that there's some talk of taking a look at that sales tax on groceries. Uh, the Democrats, the Kansas Democrats for years have been trying to get that sales tax off groceries, but it's still on there. Uh, and that would take some of the regressive sting out of the sales tax, um, but hasn't happened yet, and it would cause a revenue loss. So again, if we're already cutting the income tax, where are we going to get the money, or is it going to be further cuts to state government, or where are we going to get the money? Because as, as much as I hate the sales tax on groceries, it does raise revenue for the state. If we get rid of it, what do we do? Um, but that's where a lot of the regressivity is. Essentially, lower income people, paycheck to paycheck, consume their money, almost all that stuff is subject to the sales tax. Higher income people, yeah, they spend more on goods, but they also <laughs> have more money left to invest. Investments are not sales tax. Only consumption is sales tax. Yeah. 
She wanted to know uh, that if the, if the Laffer curve doesn't effect doesn't work, in other words, if these tax breaks don't promote so much economic growth that they put the tax revenue back through growth, uh, then we've got to cut the budget. And furthermore, the governor has been very direct and upfront that his goal is to phase out the income tax altogether with a series of tiered cuts each year. So don't we have to keep cutting the state budget? And, and, and how low do we go in terms of cutting the state budget? Um, and, the, and that's an excellent question. Um, I, I haven't seen any actual numbers. Um, but like I keep saying, it has to be K-12 and Medicaid because that's where the money is. Um, some uh, higher ed has taken some lumps and will probably take a few more, but, but the higher ed cuts are relatively modest compared to K-12 and, uh, and uh, Medicaid. Um, and Medicaid has gone up tremendously in recent years, but it's gone up tremendously because health care costs have gone up tremendously. And so it's not that people on Medicaid are receiving additional benefits compared to 15 years ago. It's that the same benefits cost way more money for the same reason those of us who have insurance are seeing that they cost way more money because health care costs are skyrocketing. Um, and so I'm sure that, that the budget cutters are looking at that budget and looking at this hockey stick curve, you know, it's flat and then it takes off, you know, like shaped like a hockey stick on its side with a sudden increase. Uh, for Medicaid and say, whoa, 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 look at that skyrocketing cost for Medicaid. It's huge. We've got to get that under control. Um, but how do you get Medicaid under control without getting the entire health care system under control? Because Medicare is just hooked to the health care system. It just grows as the cost of health care grows. Um, and so that's a really tough one. And then on the schools, uh, I think that they're, again, they, they have talked openly about saying local communities need to step up more and fund their schools with property taxes. My issue with that is that's great if you're Shawnee Mission East. No problem. <laughs> One mill and you've got a whole bunch of money coming in. Um, but if you're in, uh, if you're in Bourbon County, um, if you're in Washington County, or as we say in Kansas, Washington County, um, you can't, there's no base to tax. Um, there, there's not enough wealth to tax, and so I don't see how that's going to work either. Thank you so much. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to introduce Dennis Sweeney, who is the president of Main Street Coalition, for a few words. Thank you. First of all, thanks for coming. We appreciate you being here. Uh, I'd first of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Brandy Fisher. She's our executive director. Brandy, would you uh, raise your hand? Brandy, you're Brandy and uh, our program staff, our program committee has done an excellent job putting these uh, events together, and uh, we certainly appreciate you coming. So, I got a couple notes. First of all, there is in uh, Johnson County in the no, in the legislative wrap up. There's another one next week, May 28th, where Pat Apple, Pat Petty, and Barbara Boyer, uh, moderated by David Helley. That's seven o'clock Antioch Library, uh, no, uh, May 28th. Okay, it's put on by the League of Women. <laughs> Close enough. All right. Um, anybody that would like to get more involved in Main Street, please see Brandy or Lisa, our membership coordinators. Our membership coordinator. We need volunteers. We need to build uh, Main Street. We're trying to build our organization. We have about 700 members. Uh, we have about 1,000 uh, members if you include our household membership. We've got about 1,000 people who are uh, liking us on Facebook. And in order for us to grow our organization and to really offer a formidable uh, opposition to some of the extremism that's happening in Kansas, is we need you guys to get involved. We need you to get your friends involved. And those who aren't members, we invite you to become a member tonight. Those who are members, we invite you to uh, see one of these guys and offer uh, to get involved. Volunteer somehow. We've got some volunteer opportunities. We will use you. We need you, and we'd appreciate you get involved. Furthermore, <laughs> <laughs> all members.
memberships and renewals made this evening will be entered into a drawing to receive a $30 gift certificate to the tavern in the village. After this event, we go right across the street to the tavern. You're invited. Come on over. Get to know some of uh, the folks here at Main Street. Get to know some of the staff, the board members. We'd uh, love to have you over there. And uh, let's see. Any new members tonight get to take home a tote which says what? What does it say? Eat, drink, and vote moderately. <laughs> so, become a member tonight. Thanks for coming.